Welcome to Christ Life Ministries for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for edifying the body of Christ. Ephesians 4.12 A work of faith, a work of love, a work of perfection unto a glorious church. Amen. This afternoon, I'm going to start a series of messages, which I really don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know how far God is going to stretch it on kings and characters in the Old Testament. I downloaded some of these messages towards the end of last year, and I think earlier on this year, and there's quite a lot of them. But I'm going to start today with a trilogy of three kings. And they were good kings, but we have a lot to learn from their lives. Hezekiah, sorry, Asa, Hezekiah, and Jehoshaphat. I have another whole series on the David dynasty. Saul, Jonathan, and David, David, Joab, and Nathan, and so many others like that. And as the Holy Spirit directs me, we'll be sharing these things because we're entering into the time of the reign of David. As I speak today, Saul is still reigning, but his reign has been uh, rejected by God years and years ago. But the manifestation, like it was in the life of David, God anointed him to be king, but he didn't become king until, you know, uh, 13 years later. In our case, even taking longer because of what God is doing. God is going to change the entire leadership structure of the church. It is, and we begin to see the, the judgments, what happened in America. God is showing forth what is not, uh, uh, what does not have his approval, that that which has its approval may come forth. And when it does, there will be such a contrast. And uh, I shared this with some people. It is a prophetic word I got from the Word of God. At that time, people would say, this is our God. We have waited for Him. It would be in contrast with what they had seen before. And no man will be able to deny it. Even the unbeliever, even the uh, ones who are not Christian, will say, this is the finger of God. It is imminent. So all these are like preparations. So we want to look at three kings. First with me, turn with me firstly to give you a New Testament basis for what we're going to do, although we're going to be the Old Testament. Um, but let's read this from the New Testament. It's in Romans chapter 15. It's in verse 4. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. And I read. Say, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written... For our learning, that we, he's talking about New Testament born again, spirit filled Christians, through patience, I didn't hear you, and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. This is a very important uh, verse in the New Testament. You must understand, and sadly, many Christians seem to forget this fact. That the scriptures he was talking about were the Old Testament scriptures. At the time Paul was writing, the New Testament scriptures didn't exist. They were being written. So Paul is telling us that everything that we read in the Old Testament, observe the word whatsoever. Everybody say whatsoever. Turn to your neighbor and say whatsoever means whatsoever. So whatsoever was written in Leviticus, whether you like it or not. Whatsoever was written in Exodus. In, in, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, in Genesis, in Joshua, in Ruth, in Ecclesiastes, all were written for your learning. You do yourself a great injustice and disservice to ignore the Old Testament. He says, 
whatsoever was written aforetime, was written what for who? Us, New Testament Christians, for our learning. So we're going to look at these three kings. I don't know if I finish all three of them today. If I don't, because it's a, it's a series, I will pick it up my next, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, next lesson, uh, next time I minister here. And I want to look at three kings. These kings are all good kings. And I have put them in the order. Everybody say Asa, Hezekiah, and Jehoshaphat. Hezekiah ended better than Asa. Jehoshaphat ended better than Hezekiah. That's why I put them in that order. Let's look at Asa first. I actually mentioned him recently in one of my uh, ministrations, you know, but today we want to go in more detail. That time I just mentioned a few things. I was talking about divine healing and health, and I mentioned about Asa, and we'll still talk about, you know, we'll still mention that today. But today I'm not focusing on healing and health and, you know, and, and, and all of that. I'm talking about his character and what caused the problem. That's why it says it is written for our learning. Turn with me, first of all, to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 14. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it in bits and pieces because of time. We won't read everything. I'm going to pick a few, you know, uh, uh, um, select verses. And then I'll just fill in in between uh, for us. So Abijah... I didn't hear you. Slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. And in his days, the land was quiet ten years. I'm going to be making comments as I go along. Turn to your neighbor and say, why only ten? Why not 20? Why not 30? Why not 40? It's a question. Keep it in your heart. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord. I didn't hear you. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places, and break down the images, and cut down the grooves, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers, and to do the law and the commandment. Asa, he also rather, also, he took away out of all the cities of Judah, the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. And he built, verse 6, and he built fenced cities in Judah, for the land had rest. And he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. Turn to the and say, God will give you rest in Jesus' name. Do you, I, 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 I shared about this um, sometime last year during this COVID breakdown. And I said, Afflictions are temporal. You see, it's not the will of God that we go from fight to fight to fight to fight to fight to fight. Now we will fight. <laughs> I'm not saying, you know. But you see, God wants to bring you to a place in your Christian life where you enter rest. You know, the Bible says so. He said, there therefore remaineth a rest for the people of God. But you must labor to enter in that rest. That rest is not automatic. But if you labor and you labor properly as you should, you will enter into the place of rest. What does rest mean? Rest does not mean inactivity. It doesn't mean the devil will not be there. What it means is that there will be so much of the power of God in your life, in your, in your body, in your circumstances, in your environment, that Satan's influence will be constantly subdued. Occasionally he will attack, but even then he will not last long. And the, 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 the example I used was Daniel. You look at Daniel's life. Daniel's life started in tribulation. 
His life was hanging on a thread. He was taken as a slave from Jerusalem. After Jerusalem had been destroyed, the temple had been destroyed, and, and, and Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, his, uh, his, his, his chief of staff, the captain of the guard, came and carried all of them away. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, were all carried into Babylon. They could have been killed any minute. The way, the way Nebuchadnezzar was killing people, the, the king that was there, I think it was Zedekiah or something, he took him to a place called Ribla. He took his eyes out and killed all his sons in front of him. So, um, Daniel, I'm sure he was just watching all of that. <laughs> God, that was going to happen to us. You know, but you see, Daniel knew God. I'm sure he wasn't afraid. Even if they killed him, he knew he was going to go to God. You know, but they didn't kill him. So, they take him, they take him to Babylon. And, you know... Nebuchadnezzar perceives that these are good children. When I say children, they weren't children. They were in their teens. You know, young men who he could use. You know, so he said they should feed them and look after them. And that was the first test. Daniel said he wouldn't eat the food. The guy said, if you don't eat the food, they'll cut your head off. This will be translation. And Daniel quickly said, you know, just give us vegetables and water and check us after 10 days. After 10 days, they were fine. The guy took, the, gave them, took away the Babylonian food. You know, then later on, the guy had a dream. He interpreted it. He was going to kill all of them. He interpreted it. Then later on, he had this image, asked them to bow. Shidrak, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow. They went into the fire. They came out. Then later on, the Persians took over, and they put him in the lion's den because he prayed to God. But if you look, all this I said, these four or five incidents were all over a period of 50, 60 years. They weren't every day. Because Daniel made a habit of prayer, the power of God was so much in his life that occasionally there will be tribulation, but most of the time he had rest. It was quiet. That's how your life should be. Let me use Jesus as our example. The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, as we all know. He grew up in a place called Nazareth. For 30 years. We don't hear of anything. Nothing. We don't hear of him, you know, when he was young. They wanted to kill him. There was nothing like that. You know. Then he gets anointed with the spirit that measure and starts his ministry. For those three years, we hear of no incident of an attack that penetrated his surroundings. He wanted to go across to something. There was a storm. He calmed it. Peace be still. You know. Then... Herod wanted to kill him one time, but he was wise. He just stayed away, you know, said that fox. Whenever they tried to kill him in Nazareth, they tried to throw him on the cliff. He, was, he walked through them. In another place, you know, he went and, 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 and you know, they would try to arrest him. So people would come and say, never man speak like this man. What am I saying? I am saying Daniel, Jesus, they give us pictures of what Asa had for those 10 years of quiet, rest. It does not mean inactivity. In fact, it means intense spiritual activity in terms of prayer and walking in the Spirit, which now generates the power that creates a quiet atmosphere and the enemies, they are there. The enemies are not, it's not as if they're not there, but they are subdued. And that's how your life should be. That's not to say we will not have tribulation. That's not to say we will not have trials and tests. But if you enter into rest, the frequency, I've said this so many times, the frequency, the gravity, that is how severe, the duration, you know, of the um, um, tribulations will be at a minimum. In other words, they won't happen so often. Number two, when they do happen, the effect will be very minimal. The gravity of it, you know, uh, the, you know the, 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 the damage, what we call collateral damage, and then how long they last. They won't last some, like Daniel overnight. The blind den was over. That's the last tribulation we hear in Daniel's life. No more tribulation. Until the man died and I went to heaven and wrote the book of Daniel and left it for us. What are we saying? And here he was in a hostile environment. Babylon is one of the worst places you could be in. Idol worship, all kinds of, you know, wickedness and everything. A crazy uh, a president like uh, um, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was actually crazy. It took God to deal with him. 
So, keep that at the back of your mind. <clears throat> so, everything was fine. Then let's now jump to verse 9. And there came out, he was quiet. But this happened, this is one of the incidents that happened. And there came out against them, Zerah, the Ethiopian, was obviously a black man, with a host of a thousand thousand. Turn to your neighbor and say, do you know what a thousand thousand is? Say it's a million. It was rare in those days to have that number of an army, you know, in terms of population. Usually they were two, three, four hundred thousand. This was, they, it will frighten anybody. And 300 chariots. Chariots were a big thing in those days. It's like having today, you know, tanks, you know, that, that are highly sophisticated. That you can't even, you know, you can fire things at it. It won't, it won't affect it. And came unto Maresha. Marash, no. Maresha, okay. Then Asa, I didn't hear you, went out against him, and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephatha, all these wonderful names, at Maresha. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God. And said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. He was outnumbered and outgunned. They didn't have guns in those days, but... You know, they had archers, they had, you know, they, they, they knocked a million with 300 chariots. Asa's army was probably three, four, five hundred thousand. So, they, 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 those guys had to double the number. Then on top of that, all the weapons. That was why he prayed. Because ordinarily, he would have been, you know, um, discouraged. He would have been, he, 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 that's why he said, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with few. So, the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah. Watch this. And the Ethiopians fled. Turn to your neighbor and say, when God is on your side, the enemy will flee. That's why the Bible says, resist the devil. And he will do what? I want, to, I want to repeat that. Everybody say, resist the devil and he will flee from, uh, from you. You know what happens to most Christians? They don't, they don't resist the devil. When they see the devil, they start to cry. They are so afraid. When, see, most people, when a problem shows its head, the first thing that comes to their heart is fear. The second thing that comes to their heart is murmuring. The third thing that comes to their heart is complaint. Instead of, instead of understanding that this is the enemy and that God has allowed it so I can be victorious over him, they begin to ask God why God allowed it to come. And they begin to now blame God, murmur and complain. One thing we must learn to do, my wife was actually sharing this with some people yesterday. One thing we must all learn to do is not be like the children of Israel. They never remembered what God did. When they are faced with a fresh problem, they are, all their focus is on that problem. They forget all the other victories that God has given them. And then they begin to lift up their words and say, why have you brought to this wilderness to destroy us? The God who put all the ten plagues of Egypt. The God that split the Red Sea. The God that gave you water out of the rock. Ah, ah, give him, cut him some slack. I say that reverentially. Give him some ah, if you have another problem, can't you remember all the things he did? But that's the way the carnal mind is. 
because its control is in enmity against God. It doesn't remember. It's, it's, the carnal mind is very ungrateful. It doesn't remember what God has done. It's always quick to fear, quick to murmur, quick to complain. Ah, God, I've been serving you. Been, why do you allow this problem to come into my life? Don't you know that problems come into your life for the word's sake? It's not because you're not doing the word of God. It's because you are doing the word of God that Satan calls you a worthy opponent to attack. If you are attacked, it's a plus for you. <laughs> I didn't hear amen. Only Pastor Kwega said amen. If you are not worthy of attack, if Satan is not attacking you, it means he does not even count you worthy. You are no threat to the kingdom. But when you are attacked, it means that the kingdom of darkness recognizes you are important and you are strategic. So you should count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations and trials, don't not to murmur and complain. Count it joy. Use it as an opportunity to use the strength of God. Look at what Asa said. said, oh God, let not man prevail. How will they, how will they hear that the Ethiopians came with a million armor and they demolished the Israelites. All the other nations will rush them. This man had faith in God and God honored him. But what happened after? We have a lot to learn. I don't know if I'll be able to get to that king's say. I'm going to take my time and do it properly. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 15. See, the problem with our people, the Holy Spirit is speaking to, to you, not scripture here, to me. We don't read our Bible. Most Christians are very lazy when it comes to Bible reading. Where we do is not consistent. That is why these kind of scriptures are not familiar to many of our people. That's why God has asked me to preach from them. You know, especially our New Testament. All we know is 419. <laughs> Philippians 419. My God shall supply my uh, you know. But, uh, we have our choice uh, scriptures that we like. These are places where you are going to learn. Something happened. And the Spirit of God came. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 15. That's the next chapter. Upon Azariah. The son of Oded. <laughs> Some of these New Testament names. And he went out to meet Asa. And said unto him, Hear me, Asa. And all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you. Watch this. The prophet is giving a warning because God could see ahead. The Lord is with you while you be with him. Notice, you see... All of us, we all like just this, 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 this uh, flamboyant, no, the word is not flamboyant, you know, this Christianity that has no conditions. It's a lie. It will get you into trouble. And it will get you killed in some terrible instances. I know you won't say amen, but I'm telling you the truth. If you don't listen to the word of God and learn by the mercies and the grace of God to be fulfilling God's conditions, you cannot go and start standing on promises under whose conditions you are not fulfilling. It's called presumptuousness. It will get you killed. The Bible says my people perish for a lack of knowledge. The prophet, and I'm, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. Why did God send this prophet to Asa? By the time I finish, you, you, you will understand. He begins to warn him. They had just come from a great victory. A million Ethiopians... God smote them and they fled. So, God knowing the man's heart. <laughs> this is God who knows the heart. He had begun to see some things in Asa's heart. So, he now sends a prophet ahead of time to warn him. It's not a negative thing. What he's told him here is positive, but conditional. Why you be with him? And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, 
He will forsake you. You know, these are the kind of things people don't like to hear. Nobody wants, that's why we don't like prophets. Oh, don't come and tell me, oh, God, uh, me, oh, God forbid. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Not my portion. God can never forsake me. Now, I know that he, will, he said he would never leave us nor forsake us. But it's all conditional. It's all conditional. If you forsake him, then he will forsake you. Nobody said amen. As if it's not God's word. Because God had seen something in Ahab, Asa's heart, that had started to, was not as it should be, even though he was a good man. And I'm going to tell you the root reason by, by the time I finish. So the Bible says, this man, he still did well. Verse 3. Now for a long season, hmm, Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. Look at the church today. Very similar. 